Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Perpetual Chess bonus pod covering the first four rounds of the FIDE candidates, along with some evergreen uh, human perspective of what it's like to attend the first events in Toronto. The tournament has been fantastic so far. So first up, the plan for covering this pod. I know I had said I was only going to do two bonus pods, but I've been so riveted by this tournament that I decided, you know what, we're going to try to get a pod out on every rest day, starting with this one. We're going to be covering the tournament from a variety of perspectives. As I said, this one will be more of the sort of like the fans perspective. I am going to go through what's happened so far and share a few of my own impressions, but we won't get to the hard hitting analysis until later in the tournament. For example, on Friday, April 12th, I'll be recording an interview with friend of the pod, the always insightful legendary YouTuber, Grandmaster Daniel King. Uh, about uh, his impressions. But for this one, I'll just share a few and then get to a trip report uh, from Toronto from a friend of the pod, Dennis Markov, who was actually recently on as an adult improver, but drove up from Pennsylvania to attend the first two uh, candidates. Um, so as always, the timestamps for topics discussed are in the description. Um, and the regular perpetual chess pods will still be coming out every Tuesday, but we'll have some extra ones for those of you like me who are kind of distracted and riveted by chess history being written up in Toronto as the tournament goes on. And then we will have our regular content as well. So here's what's going on in the tournament. Of course, the, the big news as after round four is those who discounted Nepo did so at their peril. The standings are Jan Nepomnici in clear first in the open with three out of four. Uh, Gukesh and Fabiano have two and a half, obviously very much in the thick of things, half a point back. With two points, Pragananda, who has played some very entertaining chess, definitely a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and then with one and a half, we have four players, Nija Abasov, who has held his own, if not played the most fighting chess. He certainly got a good score for his rating, uh, not to be discounted. Uh, Feruja with one and a half, uh, Hikaru with one and a half, and Vidit Gujarati with one and a half. In the women's section, again, Cream kind of rising to the top already. Tanjong Yi's in first with three out of four. Goryachkina's in second with two and a half out of four. And then we have three people with two points. Katarina Lagno, uh, Vaishali, who will be a grandmaster as soon as she is ratified. And uh, Salamova is outperforming so far with two points. She had a nice win today. And then uh, with one and a half points, uh, Humpy Kaneru, Lei Tingje, and Anna Muzisha. So a few impressions to share. Again, got to be impressed with Nepo. He's just so clinical and so sharp in these candidates, brings so much preparation to bear. Um, so he's he's been an early story, looking very impressive early on. And as we know, when he gets ahead, he's... Uh, He's tough to run down. He plays well from in front, and right now he's in front. But there's been a lot of entertaining chess. Ian Nepo, again, Praganando with some super entertaining opening choices. Um, I was especially impressed with the bold opening choice of the deferred Schliemann as he defeated Vita in with Black in round three. Um, it seems like as the tournament goes on, the openings are starting to get a little more predictable. We had some Italians and Roy's today. Um, you know, I think part of the strategy might be like Nakamura sprung this dodgy Italian <laughs> on Caruana. I mean, dodgy Sicilian in on Caruana in round one. I don't think we'll be seeing that one again, but he's definitely caught him off guard. And both he and Pragananda took a, a surprising choice where they used a surprise line with the impression that I'm going to know this so much better than my opponent that I'm going to gain on the clock. And even if what I lack in objective value in my position, I'll make up for it in practical value. And in both cases, it, it worked out well. And then, of course, you have the serious prep, too, like Nepo today in the Berlin Endgame showcased a new idea. And what... I was just reading friend of the pod, Grandmaster Ravi, Raphael Latau's annotations on chess.com. And as he said, like, even if it doesn't have like insane objective strength to spring a surprise like that, when you can get someone to think that in itself has tremendous value and Vita went into the tank and the game became a uh, very tricky end game towards the end. Nepo played brilliantly and it was enough to bring the points home. And of course, as a friend of Jan Gustafsson, I'm going to give him all the credit for this uh, Knight H2 uh, maneuver. Uh, whether he deserves it or not. To, so shout out to Jan, who is definitely not listening to this podcast while he's busy seconding 
uh, the tournament. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of fun, a lot of surprising openings in the women's section. We had an Evans Gambit yesterday. Um, didn't quite work out when uh, Lei Le Tingjie tried it on Goryachkina. Goryachkina diffused it deftly, but it was a lot of fun to see that attempted. Um, as for early winners and losers impressions, you know, it's hard to get too deep, but I will say Nakamura is the one in the open section that's probably underperformed his rating um, a bit. Obviously, his loss to Vidit was you know, he didn't show his best first classical game he's lost in some years. He was quite sportsmanlike about the loss and philosophical in his video recap, but nonetheless disappointing. And I caught his interview with Mike Klein today, and he was just saying, underscoring the point that people think I'm bluffing when I say I don't care, but he's saying he really doesn't care. And it's starting to make me think that maybe that's not such a good thing in terms of uh, his his chances for this tournament. Um, there's there's a fine line between being carefree, um, which, you know, of course, can lead to creative and uh, bold play that can lead to good results versus being maybe a little callous. And um, I'm, you know, I'm not qualified to judge but it, it does increasingly become a concern as the tournament goes on. Uh, but no one in either section is out at, by any means at this point. I mean, the one and a half is the lowest score in the Open, and that's only one point. You know, that's only minus one. Uh, same story in the Open section. No one has a lower score than one and a half. So it's a little early to be writing these narratives, but, you know, you can never resist. Um, few other thoughts on the the women's side. Uh, probably a disappointing start for Lei Ting Jae with one and a half out of four. And Anna Muzichuk, I mean, back-to-back -back heartbreakers. She was just, she was like plus five in her game in round three. And today had an end game that she was so close to converting and couldn't quite get it done. So one and a half out of four on its own is not you know, it's a it's a good score. It's decent. She's in it, but it's got to be tough psychologically. So hopefully with the rest day, she'll have a chance to recover. And a similar thing for Vita again. I mean, Nepo played masterfully today. Vita just ran a little short on time. Um, but he's been he's been on both sides uh, with that impressive win against Nakamura, but then following it up with two losses. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out. So it's been fantastically entertaining. If you're just looking for a few games to check out videos for, I would recommend, uh, again, Nepo's win over Vita today for sure. Um, I, of course, enjoy people like Daniel King and Ben Feingold's recaps. Levy always gives you the, um, you know, the, the full picture of everything that happened. Uh, Nakamura and Caruana's fighting draw in round one was amazing. Nakamura played this rook sacrifice that was like off the hook. So definitely worth checking that one out. Vaishali's crushing win over Salamova in round three was super impressive. But then Salamova bounced back today with a nice win. So she's outperforming as well. Uh, Vita round two Berlin novelty beats Naka impressively. So lots to check out. And then I just wanted to share one stat that I just heard on Levy's recap. So if it's wrong, Blame Levy. You know, he's got this team of researchers working for him, unlike this little mom and pop operation here. Uh, and he said that Nepo in the 32 rounds that he's played the candidates has been ahead in 32 of them. So that's an amazing stat, if, if true. And I suspect uh, that it is. I can't recall an exception. So before we get to the fun conversation with Dennis Markov about what it was like to attend the fan zone and everything else, I'm just going to leave you with the pairings for round five. Uh, hope you have found this helpful. Hope you guys are enjoying the tournament, certainly as it goes on. If you haven't had a chance to tune in yet, I mean, if you're at work all day and get home, you know, 530 here on the East Coast or whatever it may be, that's a perfect time to tune in because when it gets to the time control, they don't have increments. So there tends to be a lot of drama happening all at once. And it's super entertaining. You can kind of like get your head together during the first couple hours, watch things unfold, but then it gets super entertaining. So anyway, round five pairings in the women's section. Lei Tingje will have white against Katarina Lagno. Uh, Baishali will have white against Anna Muzichuk. Uh, by Shali again with two points, so she's right in the thick of it. Hapi Kaneru uh, will have white against Goryachkina, and Tan Zhang Yi will have white against Salamova, who's off to a good start. In the open section, Feruja with white against Nakamura, so that'll be interesting. You got to think, Feruja, he's fighting every game, so, um, you know, 
I don't think he's happy with his one and a half. And Nakamura with black, I'm not so sure. Maybe he wouldn't mind a draw, but I expect more fighting chess. We'll see. And Naka, of course, he's been a bit surprising in his opening choices. So let's see if he can continue that. Um, Gukesh will be white against Abasov. Gukesh will probably be, you know, trying to go for the juggler in that one. Uh, Vita with white against Fabiano. Um and Pragananda with white against Nepo. Prague, again, has had some fun preparation, and he's playing to win, to his credit. So uh, we'll be interesting to see how that one shakes out as well. So been a lot of fun, but I want to get you to this interview. I hope you guys enjoy this coverage. Let me know how you enjoy the sort of perspective of people who attend versus the analysis. I mean, certainly we'll be getting more into the analysis with some good guests as the tournament goes on. But there's also, I mean, since it's in North America, uh, I still don't, you know, this conversation with Dennis really makes me want to tra- take a trip up to Canada, but it's hard for me to get away from my family. And I don't even know if my passport is up to date. Um, so I don't think I'm going to make it, but I have to admit it gets more tempting the more into this tournament I get. And I'm guessing those of you who are hardcore chess fans and tune in for the conversation with Dennis will feel the same way. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dennis Markov. Uh, enjoy the rest of the tournament. And we are here with a return guest. He was actually pretty recently on the podcast as an accomplished adult improver, episode 357. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Our friend is also going to be our first dispatch here in these bonus pods from Canada. Though Secretly, he's already back at his house in Pennsylvania. But he made a whirlwind trip to see the FIDE candidates and uh, sent me a gushing report of what this event was like. And I thought it would be fun, while it's still going on, to get some flavor of... Uh, what it's like to be there in Toronto for what's shaping up to be an epic tournament. So, uh, Dennis Markov, thanks for rejoining Perpetual Chess. Welcome back. Hey, Ben. Thank you for having me. Glad to be back. Yeah, thanks for volunteering. So, after I mentioned that I would be doing some candidates coverage, because this one is in North America, in Toronto, of course, a few people reached out right away and said, hey, I'm going, which first of all made me think, like, why aren't I going? But I'm still probably not because it's kind of hard with my family. Um And so I've got a few interviews that I'll be doing during the course of uh, the candidates uh, discussing what it's like to be there and, you know, sharing behind the scenes details. Uh, Of course, we'll also just be covering the actual dramatic tournament. But for this one, um, I really want to get into what it's like to be there. So, Dennis, first of all, when did you decide that you were going to go to the candidates? Oh, actually, I decided a long, long time ago, as soon as I heard that the candidates tournament is going to be happening in Toronto this time. I thought, all right, you know, usually things like that don't don't happen too close to where I live, right? Uh, there was this World Rapid and Blitz Championship in Samarkand, which is, you know, very difficult place to go to. Then the previous candidates tournament happened in Madrid, you know, World Championship match, you know, Dubai, and then, you know, some some other places around the world, but like Toronto is pretty close to where I am. And I thought, all right, you know, if it's happening right here, I, I will definitely go. And then I made this decision back then. And then as soon as they started selling tickets, I literally bought my tickets on the first day thinking like, all right, you'll never know how many people actually want to go there. Maybe they will run out of these tickets tomorrow. So you know what, I'll I'll, I'll book everything right now to make sure that I got it. Yeah, and I checked before we recorded, and as far as I can tell, unfortunately, they are out of tickets for the event, although it being FIDE, it's a little bit hard to sell, and the other thing I will say is it does say on the website there may be some day of tickets sold, so for anyone listening, thinking of making a last-minute trip, um, you'll probably have to do more due diligence than I did, but you may not be able to get in anymore if you don't have a ticket. Um, and were the tickets 65 bucks? Is that right, Dennis? Yeah, I think 65 Canadian dollars. So I went for first two days, day one and day two, and then it was a total of about hundred American dollars charge on my credit card. So that's, that's about, about it. A hundred each. I right, not a hundred total. Oh, so okay. 50, but 50, yeah. 50 American dollars. And then there is some sort of a VIP experience. You pay like 200 Canadian dollars and essentially you stand on the other side of the spectator's balcony. Uh, and instead of, you know, having like 40 spectators there, you would have maybe five, including Emil Sotovsky stopping by every once in a while. But other than that, doesn't seem like those VIP tickets give you too much of an advantage. Maybe if it's the only way to get a ticket right now, that would be an option. But other than that, you know, you get the full experience for 65 Canadian dollars slash 50 American dollars. Okay. Yeah, well... A few things. Number one, actually, as far as VIP tickets go, $200 really isn't that, $200 Canadian dollars really isn't that bad. 
But on the other hand, as you say, if you're not getting that much, maybe that's why. The other thing I wanted to mention is from what I could tell from the website, it did look like maybe if you buy passes for the whole event or for the whole VIP, those might be what are still available as opposed to the individual events. And again, if anyone's thinking of going, you're better off uh, doing more research than I did since I'm not currently thinking of going. But Dennis, um, did you spring for the VIP tickets at all, to be clear, or only? No, uh, no, no. So I, I went just for, for normal common tickets. Um, I'm, I'm not considering myself uh, <laughs> important enough, I guess, uh, to go for the VIP lounge. So I, I, I decided to stick with the regular ones okay and you say there were only about 40 people in the um so well uh, more than that but here, here is what happens right you buy a ticket and it gives you access to the fan zone for the whole day so you can come anytime you want you can leave anytime you want you can exit the building to get some food you know come back whatever you want right but then each ticket has a specific slot where they allow you to enter the actual like balcony in the playing hall Right, so these are like two separate parts of the building, and when your time comes, you stand as a group. They walk you in. You stand on the balcony. You have to leave your cell phone outside. You have to leave your smartwatch outside as well. You are not allowed any electronics. And if at any point of time you leave that balcony, you cannot come back. But other than that, you have a two-hour time slot, and you you stay there for this entire time, right? And they make sure that not. The whole fan zone goes there at the same time and, you know, people try to get a better spot, to get a better view, and, you know, they don't distract players. So essentially you get about maybe 30 or 40 people and that's about enough to stand on the edge of that balcony all the way around the hall so that each person gets a nice view, but then there is nobody... Not nobody who has to like, you know, jump standing behind other people to see what's going on over the boards, right? So that's that's like a small group of people which allows everyone to enjoy, um, you know, to enjoy the event. But uh, on the other hand, you don't create too much of a crowd that could potentially distract players. Okay, so if you can see the players, you can't have electronics. Yes, right. And uh, you can see players, you can see their boards, uh, wherever you are on the balcony, you can see all of them playing. And there is like a big screen on stage which shows all the boards, all current positions and uh, time on their clock. Okay. Obviously no Valbar because, you know, players see that as well. But uh, other than that, that's that's what you get there. Okay, and any sort of like headphones with commentary or no, 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 no. You cannot bring any electronics, and uh, they don't provide any any headphones as well. So basically, it's your time to do some analysis without engine. That's one thing, right? You can just watch these positions and try to guess whether this is like literally dead lost, as it was with in in this game of Feruja against Nipomnishi, where Feruja played without a rook. And you're like, is it that lost or is he seeing something that I'm not seeing at my level? And you're always trying to second guess whether they actually know what's going on or maybe, you know, you get some, you know, idea of what is actually happening. But that's a good opportunity to do some analysis on your own. That's one thing. Makes you appreciate what these players actually see and what they do, you know, because later when you check the broadcast or you check the review, you see that they made some really precise moves, several moves in a row. And, you know, like, you know, I was standing in the playing hall, I was watching this, I was not even remotely close to seeing what they saw, you know? that That's one thing. The second thing, you can actually watch players, and that's also quite interesting, surprisingly enough, right? Because, you know, there is this common misconception that if you go to a chess tournament, it's not exciting to watch because you just have people sitting and playing. But, you know, they have their facial expressions, they stand around, they walk around, they react to certain things, you know, let's say the second round game where Nakamura lost his game, uh, he literally like looked visibly disgusted with his position throughout the entire game, you know, he would make a move, he would stand, he would walk away, he would shake his head, and uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's part of the experience, you know, I don't want to say that this is like exciting to see because it's never exciting to see someone being, you know, visibly distressed about their position. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, right? You get there and you get a little bit of a feel of what actually is going on, what players are doing, feeling, how they behave over the board, and you sort of compare it to what you've seen before in all these, like, online broadcasts where they give you a little bit of that experience, you know? So it's, 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 it's an interesting experience in that sense. At least, you know, I spent two hours both days. Uh, each day I spent two hours on that balcony, and I honestly was a little bit like... 
disappointed that at some point I had to leave. I would stay right. for longer. And I, I never felt like, wow, it's too long. I'm just staying here, you know, to kind of get something out of my tickets. No, I was like, you know, if I had a chance, I would actually spend the entire game over there. I don't mind, you know, staying there without my phone, without electronics and just, you know, trying to think about what's going on. Yeah, I mean, that's almost, as I've talked about many times, that's part of the appeal of OTB chess, this sort of meditative state you can reach. And actually, in the most recent Perpetual Chess Link Fest, the free newsletter that you guys should all be subscribed to, ahem, um, I linked to a, a nice blog post by uh, Grandmaster Alex Cholovich uh, on his blog where he described going to the last candidates, and he described exactly that feeling where he said when he was there watching in person, uh, and he didn't mention the lack of eval bar or announcers, but I'm sure that's part of it. Um, he felt much more in tune with the emotions and the psychological struggle of OTB chess than you do when you're sitting and watching at home. And hearing you discuss it, Dennis, uh, you know, the same lesson rings true. And that's that's got a lot of value. <laughs> that makes me want to well, go know, as it, well. Right. You, you, you just you just get this, you know, psychological state they're in. You 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 sort of you get some more like human connection to each player, you know, you know, at this point, I personally don't have any opinions in terms of, you know, I would want this person to win. I would want that person to win. You know, you read comments online, you hear some people saying some, or you see some people saying something along the lines of like, I hope Karana can really, you know, destroy a pass of tomorrow. And you're like, I, 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 I no, I, I, I cannot agree, you know, <laughs> because they're all, they're all fighting. They're all playing. They're all strong players. It's not just, you know, it becomes a little bit more of a personal connection to players as opposed to, you know, being a fan sitting at home and thinking that each person is just like, you know, whatever, your favorite soccer team or your favorite football team, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. And and Dennis, can can you describe what the fan zone's like as well? Yeah, the fan zone essentially it's 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 almost like it's it's a very similar uh, it's a very similar room. It's like a small theater or something along these lines, right? It's actually in the basement of the actual theater, and uh, there is a screen. They have the official broadcast on the screen, and you can hear a little bit of the commentary of the official FIDE commentary. Uh, a little bit, I'm saying that because it's not like super loud. So if you really want to listen to that, I would probably recommend bringing your headphones and you so know wait, your phone. are they in the room? So this is no, no, not and Irina room. Crush, right? Right, right, right. That's that's the broadcast, but they're not in the room, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, you just hear it through some speakers, and there are some additional screens with all the boards displayed at the same time, so you can actually check any position at any moment of time. There is a 15-minute delay, which actually leads you to another strange experience. Like, for example, on the second day where uh, Hikaru lost his game, uh, he resigned. And then, like, five or ten minutes later, we all had to exit the playing venue and come back to the fan zone. And hmm. we come over there, and on the screen, he's still playing. Right. And you realize so there are maybe okay. 50 of us who know how the game ended. You know, like, you have all the players, you have all the spectators, you have feed officials. But, you know, all these, like, 7,000 people watching the Lee Chess broadcast or, you know, 30,000 people watching the live stream for chess.com or, you know, you, even the official feeder stream, they still have no idea, which is a little bit of a strange experience, right? You feel like, all right, there are just so few of us who actually know what, what happened. So going back to the fan zone, though, they have the screen, right? They have the broadcast. They have uh, screens with the boards displayed. There are maybe about 10 tables with uh, pieces and clock, and you can play some games of Blitz, you know, with anyone in the audience. If you come if you come with someone, you can play with them, you, or you can ask a random person. Um, and then there is, like, a small swag store where they sell some T-shirts and hoodies and water bottles and posters. And actually, a funny funny souvenir is is an actual pen. It's like five Canadian dollars, and these are exact same pens that the players themselves use. And it's actually it's a nice pen. It's 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 not like an expensive pen or something, but it's like heavy. It's nice to hold it in in your hand. So you know you can also get you know a pen to you know next time you play OTB games, you can record your moves same way as you know five. So, and that sounds like you got the pen. Uh, I got three, uh, but two <laughs> of them are for someone else. So nice. yeah, I got, but I got one for myself too. Did you get anything else? I got a. Feed a water bottle which says play chess on it. I thought that it would be a nice, you know, thermal water water bottle to take to some, you know, OTB games as well. I usually like having some coffee or tea with me, and you know, water bottle is nice for that. And then I got a t-shirt, but nothing like super spectacular, 
not official chess pieces or something, even though you can buy that as well. There was some high-end stuff there too. Yeah, there was some high-end stuff. Yeah, those like chess sets, uh, about $1,000 each or, or something along okay. these lines. And you can essentially have same pieces at home that these guys have when they play those those big matches. But uh, it's also not a unique set to candidates, right? It's the right. same set that was used in the World Championship. And I'm sure that most folks who ever wanted to get it most likely already have it. And how many people were in the play zone? In the play zone, I would say about maybe 100-something. Okay, the just whole like thing is so small, you know, for, for how big it is to us chess right. fans. And it's a relatively small theater yeah. in Toronto, and uh, surpri well, not surprisingly, but it, it, it's crazy how big this is for the chess world, but then people outside of the chess world, uh, they, they don't know much about the, this happening in the city. You know, Toronto is large enough so that it sort yeah. of disappears in it. Yeah, and now I know that the chess bras are doing some sort of events, but I wasn't entirely clear on what they're doing. Did you did you run into yeah, that? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, they recorded some content, that's one thing, and then a couple of times they would take uh, the microphone and just, you know, give some so comments the for the audience. Zone. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're in okay. the fan zone. You can take pictures with them, you can get autographs for, from them. There are actually quite a few reasonably famous players in that play zone that you can, you know, just, you know, come over to and ask some questions and try to talk to them, and uh, most of them are, well, I mean, all of them. As somewhat friendly maybe some of them are not but i haven't seen anyone who was unfriendly it's, it's a nice atmosphere over there and it's 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 a nice place to to be at and was there anyone you personally were super excited to see uh quite a few right speaking of the fan zone obviously sagar shah is there legend you know just yeah, based india past. right uh, yeah. his work ethic is just impressive right uh it's it's crazy how he built this chess by cindy channel and any event any big tournament happening anywhere in the world he would be there yeah and he's always there, always there and he's always working he's always filming something i would imagine that when he comes back to his hotel he has hours and hours of footage and i have no idea how he has you know even even if somebody else does you know the video editing for him uh, just like having mental power to remember what was recorded, what happened there, and how to make something out of it in the next few hours. That's that's crazy, right? He always yeah. works. Always, like 24-7. Wherever you see him, he's filming something. So uh, this is the founder of Chessbase India for anyone, uh, the, the famed YouTube channel. Uh, for anyone not familiar, but anyway, right. sir, go on. Yeah. Next. No, there were quite, quite, quite a few um, famous folks over there, some... Uh, Teams supporting players were actually there as well. Uh, Grigori Aparin was there. Christian Chirilo was there. There were some streamers, bloggers, but I'm I'm not too much into that side of you know the, of the chess world. I, I don't watch like too many channels, too many broadcasts. Uh, I don't think Levy Rosman ever showed up in the fan zone. He, he 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 did some content, he did some interviews, but it was all happening behind the scenes, and he posted something on his channel. And obviously, some other people have been outed as seconds. Friend of the pod, Jan Gustafsson, is working with Nepo. Maybe he was mm -hmm. behind that Night H2. Amazing idea today. Uh, Svidler's working with Pragananda. Uh, we knew in advance um, that uh, Ganguly is uh, working with Vide. Did you see any of these these gentlemen uh, around? Ganguly is definitely there. I haven't seen uh, haven't seen Svidler or Gustafsson. But maybe they're, they're also around, just, you know, it was Lamed only... Yar like... is working with uh, Abbasov, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, Rajabov was there as well. But uh. again, they... Well, here's the thing, right? Not all of them stop in the fan zone, but you can still see them because at some point they obviously enter the building and they exit the building. And there are quite a few fans just, you know, waiting at the player's entrance, you know, trying to get some pictures or autographs or something along these lines. So even if they don't stop in the fan zone... I would say if you're going there, your best bet would be as soon as most games are over, just exit the fan zone, go to the player's entrance, which is essentially the front entrance to the theater, and literally like stand there and wait, and you will you will definitely see someone leaving the building. And Dennis, are you an autograph guy or not really an autograph guy? Uh, not much, but here's the thing. On my second day, I was leaving. I was uh, leaving the playing hall, thinking about going home. And then, you know, I'm walking past that player's exit. And I see there is a large group of people, about maybe 20, 30 fans waiting for autographs there. And Sagar Shah is obviously there filming all of them, right? Right. So I was like, I'm not sure if I have anything to be signed or I want any autographs from anyone but let me just like stay and see what's going on and then while i'm you know thinking about that there is Ali Reza Firuja just you know walking out rushing to the shuttle he lost his game so he was not in a great mood to interact but i was like oh wow like i i, 
yeah, I, I, I just saw this guy playing, and here he is. It's interesting. And while I'm thinking about this, there is good cash walking out, and he's actually super friendly, super nice, signs a lot of, you know, postcards and posters and whatever else people had, pictures, books. Uh, he takes a selfie with everyone, you know, literally like he spends a good 20 minutes in that area, even though it's outside, it's, it's pretty cold, right? Uh, he's still there interacting with everyone, answering some questions, and, you know, obviously Sagar Shah is filming everything as well. Uh, and then, you know, some more players uh, came out, so Napo was there. Then uh, Vishanand was obviously, um, like, I, I could not resist to take a picture with him. Uh, you sort of feel like, you know, you just touched some, you know, part of chess history, you know, you, you saw like the real Vishan and then you took a picture with him. This is, this is amazing. I'm not, again, I'm not a fan of, you know, pictures or autographs or anything like that, but when it comes to Vishan and I'm like, can you I know, use it for the uh, thumbnail for this pod? Uh, absolutely. I'll send, right, picture. send it to me. Yeah. I don't blame you. I'm the same way. I'm not an autograph guy, not even really a picture guy, but if I'm, if on and like, obviously I got to interview him, but if, uh, if I got to see him in person, I'd probably I'd probably go for that one if he was willing to oblige, um, as well. So Dennis, uh, this is this has been fun. Obviously, the FOMO uh, is growing. Um, anything else that people who I mean, again, like I don't know if I can say like if you're thinking about going because I don't know this the ticket situation. Was there anything to do for people who don't have tickets? Maybe we should try that. Even coming to the playing hall, standing at the entrance, standing at the exit before games begin and after games are over um, might be quite an experience in itself, right? Again, even if you're not too much of an autograph guy or something, you know, you would come there, you would spend 20 minutes, maybe, you know, games begin at 2.30 p.m. So maybe, you know, 1.30 to 2.30, that's like your best hour, your sweet spot. Just coming there, standing there, watching some of these guys coming to the game, you know, trying to recognize faces you can recognize, right? Because it's not only players, it's also their teams. So, I don't know, might be an interesting experience in itself. Just, you know, as soon as you're nearby, why do, wouldn't you get there and get a little bit of a feel for the event, you know, see what's going on. Uh, that what would be good as well. But then if you have tickets, if you're going, that, you know, you get the whole experience and you can do quite quite a few things there. I never felt like I, you know, spent my time without like any you know getting anything for it you know being on the balcony was cool being in the fan zone was pretty cool as well uh, the swag store is nice interactions with players with players teams that's that's pretty cool obviously interacting with other chess fans I actually played quite a few blitz games played against the 2400 rated person so lost all of them but uh, got some good life lessons from nice. that as well so you know enjoyed my time for sure yeah, I mean, that's one nice thing in something like a fan zone. I have experienced that in prior matches where, like, you know, let's face it, these games are six hours. Like, the, there is something to be said for, like, your, your hangout with other chess fans. You can check in on the games, but you can also socialize and, as you say, even maybe get some some uh, free chess lessons from, from a strong player. You know, I've been comparing this event to the, well, the most recent big chess event I have been to was the World Championship match in 2016. So there are maybe some good and bad things, you know, if you compare both of them, right? So the cool thing in 2016 was that first the commentary team was actually in the same room. They were behind some sort of like a glass wall, but you could still see them working, which is, you know, maybe another part of experience as well. And then back in 2016, press conferences were held in a large hall that was actually like merged with the same spectator zone. So after the games were over, you could go to the press conference and see Magnus and Sergey answering some questions, which was actually pretty cool, you know, just being there and like literally seeing them from maybe six, seven feet away. Right here, maybe, you know, having that broadcast team in the same hall would be nice. But on the other hand, when it comes to watching uh, players doing their thing, you know, in 2016, they were sitting behind a glass wall. So you were kind of walking through some, you know, hallway and there was like a big glass in front of you. And through that glass, you would see players playing. They could not see because the glass was mirrored on their end, right? Here, you actually come in the same playing hall. You literally stand, you know, several feet away from them. You can see what's happening on their board. You can see the screen. You can see all their faces, emotions, and it's literally like, almost like being in a chess club where for some reason, you know, all these folks got together and, you know, Nipomnishi and uh, Nakamura and, um, you know, all these guys, they're, they're playing their games. And that, that sort of takes it to a little bit of a different level. So I can also see how this event was organized in a 
somewhat better way from certain aspects. Let me put it this way. Good to hear it. So in closing, Dennis, I guess it sounds like it was three days and like 600 bucks or something well spent, you'd say? Uh, yeah, I, I would say about that, right? Yep. And it's, 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 it's a cool experience, right? Toronto is a nice city. It has a lot of things you can, you can do, right? After games are over, you can also do something in the evening. Uh, but yeah, definitely great experience and definitely worth the money for me. Excellent. All right. Well, Dennis, it was good to catch up. I really appreciate the dispatch. Uh, any final thing anyone should know as, as we say goodbye? I mean, if you have a chance to go, go, you know, okay. uh, you will not like when, when you're like, you know, uh, many years later, when you think about choices you made in their life, you will not be thinking, I did a great job. I saved 600 bucks. I didn't go to the candidates match in Toronto. That will not come, you know, to your mind, but you might think, oh, you know what? I've seen something, something interesting. You know, I've had some experiences. I went yeah. to some interesting places and I, I, I sort of touched a little bit of history. I did something that was sort of interesting. So if you yeah. have a chance to go, definitely go. Well said. Yeah, life is all about uh, the experiences you you accumulate. Although obviously, for people farther away, it's going to be more than six hundred bucks. But nonetheless, uh, encourage listeners to make their own calculations, uh, as you did, Dennis. And thanks again. It was a lot of fun to uh, to get a behind the scenes visitor trip report. Thank you, Ben. All right, take care.